Good morning and welcome. After our six month hiatus, we're both online and in person for the first time for worship. We're wearing masks, social distancing, and using lots of hand sanitizer. We're refraining from handshakes and hugs and singing. We want to be respectful of others and to stay safe ourselves. We're taking a common sense approach and following the state mandates. The COVID-19 virus is just that, a virus. It's not political, it's not a plague, it's a virus. And so we'll follow the rules to guard our own health and each other's. We'll remain seated for the service. We'll listen to the music, maybe hum along to a favorite hymn, but we'll refrain from singing. We'll forgo the prayer cards for now and passing the offering plate. We'll enjoy being together at a safe distance and give thanks that we are well and able to be here today. At the end of the service, and I will remind you then as well, after the benediction, the ushers will excuse us row by row, beginning at the back. Be sure you wear your mask as you exit. Take any bulletins with you. Remember to social distance and go directly to your cars. We want to do everything in our power to stay safe and prevent any spread of the COVID virus. For some of us, being here in the building is just right. Couldn't come soon enough. Others are planning to wait a week or two to see how the opening up goes. Let the local hot spots subside before they venture out for Sunday worship. And still for others, health and family require that it be even longer before they return to in-person worship. And so with that being said, again, welcome. It's good to see you, all of you. It's a joy to worship together here and online. Our flowers this morning are given by John and Sylvia Sullivan in memory of John's father. Let's begin our time of worship.
And now if you have a bulletin, let's join together or up on the screen, let's join together in our call to worship. Mighty wind of God, stir us to praise, lift us from doubt and despair. Holy Spirit of God, enliven our spirits, heat up our compassion, burn away our fears. Mighty wind of God, revive us again. Set loose our joy in a chorus of praise. I've changed the order of the scripture passages, and I'm reading the Philippians passage first. <clears throat> to live is Christ. In this passage, Paul speaks to the community of believers from prison. His own future is very uncertain. He's torn between wanting to die and be with Christ, which he would prefer, and wanting to live in order to continue serving the Christians in Philippi. Paul believed that in this earthly life, Christians do not experience fully all that God has to give them. After beginning with his own quandary, at verse 27, he continues to urge fellow Christians to stand firm in their faith and to have one common purpose and one desire. While Paul never urges uniformity of behavior for Christians, he often encourages us to be united, one body of believers fighting for the faith of the gospel. So we begin at verse 21 and then move to verses 27 through 30. Hear the word. For what is life? To me, it is Christ. Death, then, will bring more. Now, the important thing is that your way of life should be as the gospel of Christ requires, so that whether or not I'm able to go and see you, I will hear that you are standing firm with one common purpose and that with only one desire, you are fighting together for the faith of the gospel. Don't be afraid. Always be courageous. And this will prove to them that they will lose and that you will win, because it is God who gives you the victory. For you have been given the privilege of serving Christ, not only by believing in him, but also by suffering for him, 
Now you can take part with me in the battle. It is the same battle you saw me fighting in the past. And as you hear, the one I am fighting still. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join together in our unison prayer for the morning. Holy God, weave kindness and praise into the fabric of our days so our lives become a blessing to others. Weave peace into our words and deeds so fear and anger are disarmed. Weave love into our work so accomplishments are imbued with humility. Weave kindness and understanding into our actions so the world becomes a gentler place to live. Weave hope into our every encounter so that our lives testify to your grace. Weave joy into our worship so our morning echoes in praise to you, O God. Amen. This morning, it is a joy, as I said, to have you here in worship. And also, I want to thank all of the people whose hard work made it possible for us to be here this morning. Countless hours had been put in to prepare for this day. Another joy is uh, Elaine Saunders tells me her daughter Sandy was married this past week, and so that's a great joy. On the concerned side of things, Lance Muir is back in the hospital, and she'll, so be sure to keep him in your prayers. Are there any other joys or concerns you'd like to raise? So we're going to continue to pray for Megan Marks Devlin as she returns from the hospital in the last trimester of her pregnancy. For Adrian Smith and all who are deployed uh, all over the world and especially Afghanistan. Let us take these concerns and those we hold in our own hearts and go to God in prayer.
Good morning. It's so nice to see faces out there. Since March, many of us have found time for our hobbies after doing what we were supposed to do around the house. For me, it was reading and knitting. I started thinking about what I do when I knit. I have a pattern that I have to follow. If I don't, I could end up with holes or make something that I had no intention of making. Each stitch fits with all the others. I think life is like knitting. We have a pattern to follow given to us from God. He created a world that all fits together if we follow his commandments. We can fill this world with love, understanding, and kindness. What we say and do should show we follow God, reaching out to those who need a helping hand. Loving God and walking with Him gives us hope. When we follow God's directions, His commandments, we will find the peace we seek. If you bow your heads, we'll say a prayer. Dear God, today we give thanks that we are able to worship together. As we have waited, we have tried to live as your children, loving you. We have tried to be patient since spring, and you know that having patience is hard for us. Thank you for your love, and help us share that love with others. Help us to thank you for being with us when things are going well, not just when we are in need. We ask all in your name. Amen. <coughs>
the prescribed gospel reading for the day is another thought-provoking parable. It's part of a longer passage describing what God's kingdom, the new community in Christ, will be like. The entire passage deals with teachings about marriage, divorce, children, money, success, and ambition, and what they look like in Christ Jesus. Theologians commenting on this passage know that the most difficult thing for modern Western Christians to understand about this whole section is not the individual teachings Themselves, but that such matters are more than individual concerns to be decided by each person. Matthew's perspective calls for Christians to understand themselves as first belonging to a community, so no decision is purely personal and individual as it affects many people in the community as a whole. Matthew's perspective calls for Christians to understand their lives as second being lived in the light of the present and coming kingdom of God. And this represents a reversal of cultural values rather than their confirmation. These are people who are trying to find their way to live into a new community, to come to terms with what a new understanding looks like how a new attitude plays out, and discover a new way of being in the world. These are people living at the hinge of history, from B.C. to A.D., people attempting to live into God's kingdom, both come and coming, now and not yet. You might say the kingdom is glimpsed, not fully seen as we hear of in 1 Corinthians 13. What we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. What I know now is only partial. Then it will be complete, as complete as God's knowledge of me. These believers have something to say to us, for they too are living amidst immense upheaval, great change, a sea change brought about by Jesus and his teachings about God and how God wants us to live. So hear the word, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. This is Matthew 20, 1 through 16. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a man who went out early in the morning to hire some men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them the regular wage, a silver coin a day, and sent them to work in his vineyard. He went out again to the marketplace at nine o'clock and saw some men standing there doing nothing. So he told them, you also go and work in the vineyard, and I will pay you a fair wage. So they went. Then at 12 o'clock and again at 3 o'clock, he did the same thing. It was nearly 5 o'clock when he went to the marketplace and saw some other men still standing there. Why are you wasting the whole day here doing nothing, he asked them. No one hired us, they answered. Well, then you go and work in the vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner told his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with those who were hired last and ending with those who were hired first. The men who had begun work at five o'clock were paid a silver coin each. So when the men who were the first to be hired came to be paid, they thought they would get more, but they too were given a silver coin each. They took their money and started grumbling against the employer. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, while we put up with a whole day's work in the hot sun, yet you paid them the same as you paid us. Listen, friend, the owner answered one of them. I have not cheated you. After all, you agreed to do a day's work for one silver coin. Now take your pay and go home. I want 
ought to give this man who was hired last as much as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do as I wish with my own money? Or are you jealous because I am generous? And Jesus concluded, so those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. The word of the Lord for us, God's people, in today's world. When grace is applied, 
It's not that any one of us is more deserving than another. We're all sinners saved by grace. The parable makes the point that resentment and jealousy of the grace given others has no place in the new community. The new community, this God's kingdom community, it's not about setting up a hierarchy of worthiness or holiness or keeping up a riffraff. The new community Jesus points to is about kindness, relationships, dignity, it's about being hospitable to strangers, building community and fellowship among believers, and treating others the way you want to treat them. In this new community, people are kind. Not pushovers or fools, but kind and caring. Now you might be wondering, how do I do that? How do I go about putting others first and being kind? A wise teacher named Aswar offers these thoughts on putting others first. There is no special secret in this. You only need to remember that what irritates you irritates others. Nobody likes a joke at his expense. No one likes to be talked about behind her back. No one likes to be ignored when he says hello, or to be talked down to, or to be interrupted. Everybody is hurt by rudeness, agitated by being crushed or pressured. Being kind, that's the sum and substance of putting others first. The poetry of Robert Burns says this, the heart, benevolent and kind, the most resembles God. When our fellowship, our church community, is at its best, we can glimpse a bit of God's kingdom here on earth. God made us to live and work with others to be part of the body of Christ. The new community in Christ inspires us to grow and discover who we are what we believe and value, to express who we are, to build relationships with others. That's why we miss each other when we're apart. A positive, encouraging community has a tangible impact on our individual self-awareness and fulfillment, helps us feel more connected to our environment and the people in it. Such connection provides a support system for us when we're in need of encouragement or sympathy. Feeling strongly connected to the group prevents alienation, anxiety, and depression. And it also works to combat mental illness arising from such feelings. Positive community experiences provide us with a sense of belonging, the feeling of being able to express ourselves without being judged. Belonging to a positive, good community encourages us to speak up about our ideas and opinions, and so leads us to self-reflection and exploration of our core values and beliefs. To create that positive, good community, which facilitates that glimpse of God's kingdom, a pioneering Israeli teacher, Adi Hulk Shor, has some wisdom to offer. Her experience is in creating primary school classrooms, which are intentionally inclusive, respectful, accepting of diversity in each other. In my own kindergarten class, there was a girl who had had polio, and because of that, she walked with a limp and had a shoe that had an extra thick uh, sole. Now, you know how kindergartners are. They make fun of other kids who are different. But fortunately, we had a teacher like this at Abby of Shore, and she explained to us why her shoe was the way it was, and that we were not to make fun or do anything uh, like that. The kids do. 
you know, we were inclusive and respectful. And where we break from the ghetto, that you must accept diversity in each other. That way, no one feels the social isolation so commonly experienced by those with visible disabilities. She says, for me, the biggest mission is to create communities of kindness, where people understand that diversity is a blessing and it's an opportunity to see a range of human experiences out there. The idea is that everyone belongs. I think this revolution of inclusion can really change people's outlooks. So, workers in the vineyard, potential creators of a good community, the parable surely does what it's intended to do causes us to stop, to wonder as we consider God's grace, to think on what sort of community is the good community, one which dwells in God's kingdom. It causes us to reflect on how our Lord would have us go about growing, nurturing, and bringing about such community. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we give you thanks for this time together. We pray that you keep us all safe and well in these coming days. We pray, Lord, that you help us in our striving to build good and hospitable community, to learn how it is to be kind. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all throughout this communion. Amen. Amen.